How often are you able to get deep insight into your personal guitar journey and life from one of your guitar heroes? Chances are not that often, but that's gonna change today because today you're gonna get six lessons from Molly Tuttle. Plus, I'm gonna present you with the opportunity of a lifetime. For those of you who have watched the Acoustic Tuesday show for some time already know this about me, but for those of you who are new, I'm a huge Molly Tuttle fan. And today I'll be sharing with you six lessons from Molly Tuttle. Now I combed through all of the interviews I could find with Molly on YouTube, and I selected two interviews that I thought were, well, quite fantastic and really revealed some wonderful guitar geek, well, we'll call them wisdom nuggets. In fact, I just wanna give credit where credit's due first. Uh, this first interview we'll be taking a look at, taking some snippets from is Q on CBC with Tom Power. And then the second one I'll be referencing is E-Town with Nick Forster. Some of you may be familiar with that because Nick interviews a ton of great musicians and has, a, I believe, a podcast as well as a YouTube show uh, in addition to that. Now, after I share these lessons, uh, important, I'll be asking you what you would like to learn or ask from Molly Tuttle if you ever had the chance to sit down with her. And I'll give you some more details on why I'm asking you that question here in a bit. Uh, so for now, let's go ahead and dig into Molly Tuttle's lessons. This first lesson that I kind of stumbled upon in watching this interview has to do with how you should approach the guitar. She was asked a question about what was it like having your dad as a teacher? And here's how she responded. Is that an, is that an interesting dynamic to like have your father as a teacher? Yeah, it was a different dynamic because I had taken music lessons before on piano and violin and nothing really stuck and it always seemed kind of like a chore that I had to practice. Um, so I, I think when I started learning from my dad, it just happened more naturally and I was interested in guitar. So we brought home like a little baby Taylor guitar and then every now and then I'd be like, hey, I want to learn a chord or learn a new tune or I'd just pick up the guitar and start playing and he would show me something. So it didn't feel like really like a chore anymore. It felt just like a fun thing that I could do when I, when I wanted to. So yes, lesson number six, have fun with the guitar. The guitar shouldn't be a chore. Playing the guitar shouldn't be a chore. You should have fun every time you sit down with the instrument because that is what fuels your progress. Let's move on to the next lesson. And this lesson was really one that wowed me. I couldn't believe I was hearing Molly say what I was hearing her say. In fact, there's a story that's associated with this that goes into a little bit more detail. But this was kind of stumbled upon when she was asked, hey, what was it like going to Berkeley for the first time? Here's what she had to say. You, you go to the school coming from such a distinct bluegrass background. You know, your dad being this esteemed bluegrass player, you being the sort of bluegrass phenom, playing in the bluegrass family band. But you're going to the school where kids are hotshot jazz musicians, mm -hmm. rock musicians, electronic musicians. Mm -hmm. I can't, was, that a, was that a bit of a culture shock for you to walk into that room? It was a little bit um, in a lot of my classes. Like, I didn't know anything about music theory. I was really uncomfortable playing over any jazz standards. And so I just had to let go of all my ego that I may have had previously. You had a feeling, little bit maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. It was just like, I think it was pretty easy to just be like, okay, I'm a beginner here basically and I'm going to just soak in as much as I can because there's so many amazing teachers and other students and most of the students I was playing with at the time I felt were more advanced than I was at like improvising and everyone was just working so hard. Um, so yeah, I just kind of came in with an open mind and just didn't like, tried not to have an ego about it. And yeah, it was a really good experience. So. Yes, lesson number five is ego is the enemy. Not only is that the name of one of my favorite books, it's a lesson that Molly taught me in that interview. You know, I can't imagine going to Berkeley and being surrounded by that caliber of musicians. And Molly so eloquently just said, hey, you know, gotta check your ego at the door and keep an open mind. And I think that's something we all can incorporate into our own guitar journeys. Let's move on to the next lesson. And this has everything to do with the people you surround yourself with. Here's what Molly has to say after being asked about winning a certain award and the people she surrounds herself with. I remember when I first got nominated, I was just so honored and I couldn't believe that had happened. And um, I grew up in the bluegrass community, so I've 
just been a part of that world for so long and to feel all the support from the IBMA voters just lifting me up in that way felt amazing and then I started thinking about it and I was like hmm I don't know if any women have been nominated for this award and then I saw somewhere that I was the first woman to even be nominated even be nominated yeah, yeah. and so that was really kind of emotional for me because I was thinking about women who I thought deserved to be nominated before and also just thinking about like why there haven't been more women guitar players. I think girls who play guitar and want to go to bluegrass jams or enter that world, there's a different sort of, you kind of have to like prove yourself like the expectation is a little lower and it can be pretty intimidating. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone just needs to work together to support girls playing instruments and playing music in general. So yes, lesson number four is community and really the importance of it. One of the things that I put in my notes is, is to lean on the community to lift you up and then lift up your community. It's really a two-way street. So surround yourself with your friends, people that are supportive of your guitar journey, and then at every chance you get, try and help them in their guitar journeys as well. All right, moving on. This finds us going into new territory. In fact, this will be a new interviewer you'll see. This is the E-Town with Nick Forrester interview. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was Nick had asked Molly about growing up in a musical household. And here's what she had to say. Uh, our couches were always like full of instruments. You couldn't really sit on any of them unless you were holding an instrument. So that's a um, good motivation. Yeah. yeah. And I try to keep that spirit now wherever I live, just have them lying around so you're more likely to pick one up. Yes. Lesson number three is keep your guitar accessible. As you heard Molly say, you know, guitars were laying around all the time. You basically had to move one to sit down, so you may as well play it. And I think this is, this is something we can apply to all of our guitar journeys. In fact, you know, keeping your guitar accessible not only reminds you of the fun and joy that you have when playing guitar, but it also reminds you that, hey, you should sit down and play every once in a while. Uh, for me, it looks like I leave a case in my living room, a guitar in its case in the living room. And uh, Whitney doesn't love that, but she knows that it's important to me. And it also reminds me to continue to play and you know, even play when I have some downtime. You know, If it's there and kind of a visual reminder, chances are you'll play. All right, moving on to the next uh, lesson from Molly here. This was um, this was a really interesting question that Nick had asked her about claw hammer guitar, and here's how she answered it. It's a it's a rhythmic uh, approach to playing the banjo that involves a called, called frailing or claw hammer, but mm -hmm. um, and you figured out a way to do that on the guitar a little bit too. Yeah, um, I start yeah I started on claw hammer banjo, and then I was at a music camp that I was teaching at. It was one of the first camps I ever taught at when I was a teenager and there was this guy, Michael Stadler, who was teaching a class on claw hammer guitar. And I just randomly went to it in one of my off, off periods and he showed me this tuning you can use that's like a banjo tuning basically. And um, just he showed me a simple melody using yeah. claw hammer on the guitar and I thought that was really cool. So I went home and worked on it a bunch and kind of figured out these different rhythms to do on the guitar that I liked a little better than on the banjo. So lesson number two is forever be a student. Always be learning, keep that open mind, and always try to innovate on the guitar. If you have a certain sound in your head, chase that sound. Try and get it out of your instrument. And I think, you know, we're all certainly happy and, 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 and thrilled that Molly plays claw hammer guitar, but that really came about because she is always a student. She was looking for other ways to innovate her guitar playing, and voila. Now she's known as, as an incredible claw hammer guitar player, and I think we can take that wisdom and apply it to, well, apply it to your own guitar journey and try and innovate with something that interests you. Try and come up with a new style or a new approach that really kind of excites you and, again, remind you that you are always a student. That's one of the things I love about guitar is that, well, you're always learning. You can never stop learning on guitar, or you shouldn't stop learning on guitar, I should say that. All right, let's go down to lesson number one. And this really had to do, I need to set this up and give it a little context because Nick had asked Molly um, about some of her activities with alopecia and other charitable organizations. And she answered it with this wisdom well beyond her years. And I just, it, it kind of, it's one of those responses that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, wow. That is really deep. It's super insightful. And I think it's something that we all need to hear. So, well, here it is. Yeah, I think so. I think it's really changed who I was. I don't know who I would be if I didn't have alopecia. And I think that's 
there's definitely struggles and things I still struggle with, but I think overall it's been a really positive yeah. thing. And I think it's great to just embrace who you are and eventually it becomes something that you're proud of, which it has for me. Yeah. <laughs> You wrote something really beautiful on your website, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to quote it. it. You said, having alopecia has taught me that there's nothing normal about everyone being the same. Humans are beautifully diverse. We all have work to do to make our world a safer and more welcoming place for everyone, regardless of appearance, race, age, sexuality, gender identity, disability, or anything else that makes us human. So lesson number one is embrace who you are. Embrace who you are and try your best to be okay with it. Sometimes that's not so easy as, as I'm finding. In fact, uh, Molly saying this actually made me think of a certain mindset that is the enemy of all of our guitar journeys that I'm gonna actually talk about a little bit later on today's show. But again, lesson number one, embrace who you are and be okay with it. Enjoy your, enjoy your guitar journey. Be who you are and uh, make sure that um, you think about that every time you pick up your guitar because it's easy to fall into some common pitfalls. Again, I'll get into those a little bit later. Uh, so real quick, just a recap of the lessons uh, that we just learned from Molly Tuttle. Have fun with your guitar. Ego is the enemy. Lift your community up and then lift up your community. I mean, have the community lift you up and then lift up your community. Uh, keep your guitars accessible so you play them. Always be a student, and then lesson number one, embrace who you are. Now, here comes your opportunity of a lifetime. First and foremost, well, this isn't your opportunity of a lifetime, but it is an opportunity that I, I, I hope you pursue. Uh, if you visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT146, you'll be able to see both of these interviews in their entirety, uh, both the Tom Power interview and the Nick Forrester interview, uh, both with Molly Tuttle. And I gotta say, uh, the, the Tom Power interview is about a half hour long. The Nick Forrester interview is about, uh, I think, just shy of 20 minutes long. And they are just full of guitar geek wisdom, full of these wonderful little quips that Molly says that are just so insightful. And, and it was tough for me to boil it down to six lessons, but I thought these were the most important. There's some other great ones in there and even a really cool story about how Molly had to audition for Berkeley, and then she got a certain set of scores that were pretty jaw dropping. That was in the uh, Tom Power interview. So I encourage you to check that out again at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT146. Now here's your opportunity of a lifetime. I'll tell you a little bit of a story. So just a couple weeks ago, I was on Instagram. I'm new to Instagram, so please follow tack.guitar on Instagram. And uh, I thought, well, Molly Tuttle's on Instagram. Why not just send a message? to see if she'd be interested in sitting down for an interview, a virtual interview, of course, at a safe social distance. And uh, a couple days went by and I didn't get a reply and I thought, you know, she probably gets a bazillion messages. You know, she probably just totally bogged down with all these messages. Well, lo and behold, that evening, I had this thought in my mind. She responded, she said, that sounds really fun. Uh, make sure to reach out to my manager and we'll try and set something up. So I did that and I'm currently in the process of setting up a virtual interview with Molly. It's not confirmed yet, but it's very close. And I will ask you this, this is your opportunity. If you were to sit down across from Molly Tuttle, what question or questions would you ans ask her? <laughs> not answer, ask her. Uh, and if you have a question for Molly, please leave it in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you and what you want to know from Molly because when I do have this chance, I want to, uh, well, I want to ask her questions on all of our behalf, this entire Guitar Geek community. So please, in the comments below, leave a question that you may have for Molly Tuttle could be playing related, songwriting related, gear related, you name it, leave it in the comments and I'll try my best to squeeze those in when I do have the chance to sit down and talk to her. All right, this week on Acoustic Tuesday, we've already learned some guitar and life lessons from Molly Tuttle. You're gonna learn the details about the Molly Tuttle signature guitar from Thompson Guitars in Sisters, Oregon, and you're gonna learn how a certain type of mindset can actually ruin your guitar journey. And uh, you're gonna wanna stay tuned for that because it's very, very important you know what to avoid.
Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode number 146. This is the show where you're gonna learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm gonna share with you my guitar geek list for the week, but prior to doing that, well, I need to ask you a guitar geek trivia question. Now, you might be thinking, I wonder what Tony's gonna ask me this week. And if you're wondering that, and if you're thinking it's probably something related to Molly Tuttle, well, you're right. She is the subject of our question, and here it is. How many IBMA Guitar Player of the Year awards has Molly Tuttle won as of June 2020? Is it zero, one, two, or three? Go ahead and ponder that, and at the end of the show, I'll be sure to give you the answer. Now, first up on my list today, well, I guess it's technically second, because we've already learned from Molly. Uh, next up on my list is Molly Tuttle's signature Preston Thompson guitar. Now, this is a guitar that I have lusted after. I've done a ton of research on, and I really dig the story behind the instrument. But let me first kind of walk you through this wonderful narrative. Um, so for those of you who might have never heard of Thompson guitars before, I wanna first get everyone on the same page. Thompson guitars are made in Sisters, Oregon. I'm lucky enough, I purchased one of their guitars uh, two years ago now, and it has become uh, since become one of my favorite dreadnoughts to play. It's just got horsepower and tone for days, and I just, I just enjoy it. It brings a smile to my face every single time I play it. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with Thompson guitars, you might not really know, you might not even know about them. So I found a wonderful video that they shot. We're gonna look at a little piece of it that kind of introduces you to the Thompson crew and really their passion behind making guitars. I think a lot about like how Sometimes these guitars will be in maybe a family, you know, family line for a long time. Um, we have some people that have got guitars that are planning on passing them down to their children, and, and we've done some pretty beautiful design elements for that. I just hope that it just brings joy and that it, that it continues to play and, and be the guitar that we've created, and hopefully it'll live on for well over 100 years. My hope is that they, that they kind of feel you know, all of our love that we put into it and all of our passion. I mean, initially, what was different was Preston. His kind of outlook, his drive on it was like, he's doing something a little bit different than everybody else, kind of. Just like the way he approached it was a lot different than everybody else. That, to me, it became more than just a job. It was like, you know, I like see these guitars on stage and stuff, and I like see myself sort of in them. Every person is different. And likewise, every guitar is going to be different because every piece of wood is different. So, kind of have to appreciate that and honoring the tradition too. You're going to see some, something different every time, but always pushing the bar of beauty and design and quality. It's, it is a mixture of art and science. Having been there in the beginning and, and kind of shared the dream of of this business and building these kind of instruments for for me that's a, a big part of it it's not a factory we take really great pride in what we do and i think it shows at the end you know every little step of the way you're just pouring so much of yourself into that instrument you know the care and i know preston you know he'd want me to keep on doing it just like i'm doing it because I, every day I strive to make him proud, and uh, I love it. Now that you've seen some of the Thompson crew and kind of gotten a behind the scenes look, not only in the shop, but the, the mentality that the Luthiers have there, I want to kind of bring the story one step further. Uh, Molly's involvement with Thompson Guitars, to the best of my knowledge, uh, started when she commissioned a custom guitar from them, and she received it some years ago, and she was lucky enough to have actually uh, have Preston Thompson deliver it to her. Now, Preston Thompson has since passed, so this is a, a really uh, a, kind of a, one of those sweet moments captured on film. This is uh, Preston delivering the guitar to her and Molly playing really her first tune on the guitar. Here it is. <laughs>
Now that guitar was quite different than the Molly Tuttle signature guitar that I'm about to share with you. That particular guitar had a really dark kind of Gibson-esque uh, sunburst finish on it. It had a rose on the headstock and Brazilian rosewood back and sides. For Molly Tuttle's signature model, she went a different tonal direction and I'm really happy that she did. Uh, both her and the Thompson crew worked together to create this model and this is a Gorgeous, gorgeous guitar. I can't say enough good things about this guitar aesthetically, not to mention tonally, and you're actually gonna hear it here in just a little bit. But uh, let me give you a couple of the specs just so you can get your head wrapped around what this guitar might sound like. And then uh, you can kind of test your knowledge because we're gonna listen to it here in just a little bit. So the official model name is the DMT-SMA. And this guitar has an Adirondack spruce top. The back and sides are a beautiful sinker mahogany. Now this, this mahogany is, I don't normally say this about mahogany, but it's really striking to look at. It has some really beautiful kind of ribboning in it. I, I don't know if that's the technical term or not, but it seems about right. And it has almost this, this wonderful color gradation between really kind of a, a lighter chocolate brown to a darker, more rich brown. And uh, wow, uh, not only visually is it awesome, but it sounds great as well. Uh, let's sink into a couple more specs. One thing to know about this guitar is that it actually, <laughs> there's only gonna be 30 made. There's only gonna be 30 of this model made. It's a limited run, and each model actually comes with a custom label that's different from the standard label and says what number it is of 30, where it is in the series, which is kind of special. So if you're interested, make sure to act because, well, there's only 30. A lot of guitar geeks in the world, only 30 Molly Tuttle signature models. Um, a couple more specs, and really we're gonna sink into the story uh, of a couple of these specs because I think Signature guitars are so neat because not only is it a spec combination that the artist and the, the luthier kind of come up with, but there's also these visual elements that really tell a story. So let's let's dig into those. On the, on the fingerboard, there's an inlay of palm leaves, both at the nut end of the guitar as well as the sound hole end of the guitar. And there's an interesting story behind this because Molly's uh, most recent album featured some palm leaves on the cover. This inspired one of Molly's friends to create a, a stage garment for Molly with those palm leaves on it. And then when they were developing this model of guitar, they thought well, that would be a really cool fingerboard inlay. And I think it's a great aesthetic touch. It kind of bookends the fingerboard. It's not something you see all the time. And it's really a, a, a nice personal touch. So uh, kudos to the not only the Thompson team, but Molly for picking out just a, a really cool, subtle, and classy inlay. And one that tells a story at that. Uh, speaking of the fingerboard, let's zoom in on the dots of the fingerboard. These might just seem like uh, standard fret position markers, but they're really not. We've got a mother of pearl uh, outer circle and in the middle inlaid is a redwood dot. Now, you might think, oh, that's really cool and visually interesting, and it is, but it also tells a story. Uh, Molly grew up in Northern California, and that redwood in the center of the Mother of Pearl signifies that, because in Northern California, that's where the redwoods are, so it's really cool to have that kind of incorporation into the fingerboard of the guitar. Again, a subtle, but classy, a subtle and classy appointment that actually tells a really interesting story. Now, a couple of more uh, details on the specs of the guitar. It's like kind of some geeky things. 25.4-inch uh, scale length, inch and 11 sixteenths nut width, and uh, Waverly tuners as well. Those super smooth Waverly tuners that I personally love. Now, we're gonna get to the sound of this guitar in a second, and uh, Molly, actually, because of the whole quarantine thing, um, was never able to actually tour and grace a stage with this guitar, but, she did a Facebook Live, I wanna say less than a month ago, a couple weeks ago maybe, and she played this guitar for everybody in attendance. And it was so delightful to hear this guitar. And uh, one quick detail about the guitar itself before we listen to the performances, I believe, now uh, you might wanna check the, the recording of the Facebook Live, which you can access at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT146. I believe she says in this uh, Facebook Live, you can order these specs on any size guitar. So it doesn't have to be a dreadnought. I believe, I believe it can be any other size, triple O, O, M, single O, double O, you name it. But please uh, verify that, uh, that against the, the Facebook Live recording. And speaking of that Facebook Live recording, let's go ahead and listen to this guitar uh, played by Molly herself. You might be wondering how it sounds flat picked since it's a nice bluegrass dreadnought. Well, Molly answers that question by playing the tune, Keeping the Cats Happy. Thank you. 
Pretty damn good guitar. I mean, it sounds stunning. It sounds so great, so clear and articulate, and has this wonderful body to it. Even you know the audio quality on those Facebook Lives, while uh, is okay, it's not studio quality by any means. But you really do get the gist of the guitar and. It's pretty impressive at that. Now, for those of you who find yourselves maybe more finger pickers and less flat pickers, uh, Molly Tuttle went ahead and read our minds and played a finger picking tune on it as well. So you could kind of hear the guitar's versatility. And she chose to finger pick the song, The High Road off of her newest album. And here it is. All in all, a stellar guitar. Really uh, quite versatile, visually appealing, and you know, tone for days. Uh, if I've if I've really come to know anything about the folks at Thompson, is that every guitar that leaves that shop is a stunner, uh, and really. Um, they, are, they have this knack for wrapping up this wonderful, woody, warm, vintage-type tone in a brand new instrument. And since I've gotten mine, it's only gotten better. Uh, so I'm super excited to share the details with the Molly Tuttle model with you. If you want to learn more about it, please visit AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT146. Uh, when you go there, you'll be able to see a link that goes to Thompson Guitars. If you happen to be interested in this guitar and you think, holy smokes, I want one of those 30, make sure to reach out to Christine at Thompson Guitar. She'd be happy to answer your questions. She's just an awesome human being at that, and uh, as is everybody over at the shop in Sisters, Oregon. So uh, make sure to check that out again by visiting acousticlife.tv forward slash AT146. All right, I wanna hop in our time machine real quick, fire it up, go back to episode 144. You might be wondering which episode that is. That was the flight case episode which landed to mixed reaction, let's be honest. Some thought it was a fantastic episode, packed full of information. Others referred to it as a stinker. And um, at first I was like, oh, I was really bummed actually, to be honest, the, the human side of me, to be transparent with you all. I was like, man, this, this episode really didn't seem to land all that well. But there were positive comments, there were some negative comments, there were comments in the middle, and that's totally fine, and that's one of the beauties of this Acoustic Tuesday community, is we can actually have a discussion about this stuff. In fact, I've chosen some comments as kind of discussion points, and I'm really excited about this, because it's a chance for us to kind of just, again, generate a discussion about a topic that I didn't think was such a hot button topic, but apparently it is. So let's dig into those comments. The first one has nothing to do with flight cases at all. It's just an observation by, by a good friend of mine through the Acoustic Tuesday show. Sean DeBurka says this, four boxes of humidipacks, an indicator of the size of the guitar signal. That resonated with me. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, uh, four boxes of humidipacks. I, I order four boxes about every two months or so. It seems to be two or three months. Now that we're in summer, it'll probably be a little bit longer. But um, 
Yes, Sean, good observation, and I'm glad it resonated with you. A uh, special note, I wanna thank Sean for sending me his new album, Shapeshifter, that just came out June 1st. And uh, if you like percussive acoustic guitar, if you like wonderful compositions, if you find yourself in, in, in kind of, <laughs> if you find yourself comparing yourself to me and saying, yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm an acoustic guitar geek, but I'm also a metalhead, uh, this is an album that you should check out. It's called Shapeshifter by Sean DeBurka, uh, one of our friendly guitar geeks here in the Acoustic Tuesday community. Uh, he sent me an advanced copy of that and I've just thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I've listened to disc one about 30 times. In fact, Whitney even made a comment. She's like, I really like this. I'm like, yeah, he, he, likes, he likes Blink-182 and you can hear the influence in the music. Anyways, I'm gushing a little bit, but I'm super proud of you, Sean, and, and congratulations on releasing the album. That's a huge, huge deal. Moving on to our next comment. This one comes from Jason Marshall. And he says this, not to be a jerk, but this was basically a 48 minute commercial for Calton cases. You can get TSA approved hard cases that are waterproof and airtight for about a third of the price of the Calton case. Here's a $342 option from Sweetwater. And I don't, first of all, Jason, I don't think you're a jerk at all, but there's a couple of clarifications I wanna make with the comment. Uh, first, let's just get the timing thing out of the way. A 48 minute commercial for Calton. I actually only talked about Calton for about 12 minutes. So our timing's a little bit off there, but I can let it slide, that's fine. Um, but what I really wanted to sink in here is the, uh, the flight case that he recommended. It's, I, he links to it, and you can find it in the comments of that episode, he links to an SKB case. I believe it's the I-Series case, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's kind of a big rectangle case that's actually got wheels on the bottom. And uh, I've actually seen that case. I have uh, dear friends that use that case to great success. And that's totally fine. And I think it's a great option for those that wish to consider it. Uh, for me personally, in my world, uh, when I'm traveling with my instruments, I feel most comfortable and get the most peace of mind from a Calton case. I have experience with them. I've, I've had a Calton case for 15 years now. I had my original one yeah, 15 years, it's been a while. Uh, so I'm most comfortable with a Calton case and I think they're worth that to me. And for those who think that price tag is preposterous, that's totally fine. I I'm not here to say that Calton cases are the end all be all of cases. They're my personal favorite. And if somebody asks me about a flight case, that's what I'll recommend. However, this, this flight case that you mentioned here, uh, the SKB case, it's a great flight case. It it's, doesn't give me the peace of mind that a Calton does, but for some it does, and that's totally fine. There's a lot of options out there. There's a bazillion different flight case. You've got Hiscox, you've got uh, a Calton, of course, Hoffy, Price, uh, Mark Leaf cases, SKB makes cases, Gator makes cases. I mean, there's, there's a whole slew of them. So I'm, I'm just sharing what I think is the best for me. Uh, and I th I'm glad that you entered that option in the comments because for those that maybe want a flight case and, and the high priced ones aren't in their budget, this is a great option. So thanks for leaving the comment, Jason, kind of spurring on some discussion. Our next comment comes from Davy Joe Weaver, and he says this, great show as always, Tony. When I think of something happening to my guitar, well, I can't think about it. Something this special, this meaningful, and this therapeutic, I protect. Now I have very little need for a travel case and have a good rugged tailor case, which serves me well. If I did lots of gigging or even road travel, I'd have one. But the more I think about it, question. <laughs> much geeky joy, Davy Joe in PA. And that's another thing I wanted to mention. I think you know we can take as much from uh, uh, this comment as the last is that you know if you find yourself not traveling, maybe, maybe a flight case isn't as useful as maybe I'd find it or somebody else would find it. And that's totally fine too. But I just wanted to kind of share some of the benefits of the flight case, kind of beyond just what we think of them, but just as simple protection. Cause there's, there's quite a few actually. Uh, so thanks again, Davy Joe for leaving that comment. I'm looking at the camera right now and I'm seeing my hair and I, I call it the Kraken cause it starts to creep forward while we do this filming. So I'm gonna just fix it here real quick. Colorado Kyle's like, dude, you gotta fix your hair. It's like a wild man. And I said, I won't fix it unless he refers to it as the Kraken. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Our next comment comes from Fingers, an apt guitar geek name. And they say this, $1,600 guitar cases are probably relevant to 10% of your audience. If you're lucky slash talented enough to own a high priced instrument, then your publicity video may make sense. Now, at first I read this comment and I, it, 
it kind of saddened me um, because I just I kind of read it through a negative lens. But I thought let's let's actually look at this through a positive kind of discussion opening lens. And in doing that, um, I'm not going to necessarily take take any offense or anything to the the first part of the statement. It's the second part of the statement. I'm going to reread it by itself so we can really sink into it. And I'm going to share some some thoughts about it. Quote. If you are lucky slash talented enough to own a high-priced instrument, I'll read it one more time and see if maybe it hits you the way that it hits me. If you are lucky slash talented enough to own a high-priced instrument. I read this at first and I thought maybe that's true. Maybe maybe guitar the, the, the Calton cases are only for 10% of people in the audience, but I think the knowledge is for everybody. We should all you know better ourselves in terms of increasing our knowledge of different gear and things like that, you know, as us guitar geeks do. But this statement hit me. If you're lucky slash talented enough to own a high priced instrument, this is one of the misconceptions I just want to hit kind of uh, square on. I think so often there's this equation we, we make in our minds that is, okay, high priced instrument means I have to be good enough to deserve it. I have to be talented enough to deserve it. I have to be skilled enough to deserve it. Or vice versa, if you see somebody with a high-priced instrument, chances are the first thought that comes to your head is, wow, that person must be really good because they have such a nice guitar. Talent, skill, has nothing to do with the guitar you choose. The guitar you choose is based solely on what inspires you to pick it up, have fun, and play the darn thing. So for some of us, for, for some of us, there could be a beginner that says, you know what? I've, I've always seen a Martin D45 and that's the guitar I want to start on. That's the guitar that makes me excited. That's a guitar that screams, hey, pick me up, play me. And if that person's a beginner, I don't ever want them to feel like they shouldn't buy that because they don't deserve it. They absolutely do, do deserve it. If it's in their wheelhouse and they can afford it, by all means, if you're just starting the guitar and you want a Martin D45, get yourself a Martin D45 because chances are if you get the guitar of your dreams, you're going to pick it up, you're going to play it, it's going to inspire you, and we all know that the more fun you have with your guitar, the more times you pick it up, the more progress you're going to feel. So I just I just wanted to nail this misconception straight away and say, you know, the, the type of guitar you play is not a reflection of the type of player you are. It's not a reflection of how much skill you have. It's not a reflection of how much you practice. It's not a reflection of how many songs you know. It's just a reflection of you and what inspires you. For some of us, a mid-level guitar is fantastic and it inspires us and it's within our wheelhouse and that's fine. For some of us, we wanna shoot for the stars and if, if, that, if that guitar is in your range and you can afford it, please go for it. So I want to thank Fingers for leaving that comment because I think it, it opened up this discussion on, on what I think one of the most common misconceptions is. And again, it was nice to revisit these comments some days later and really kind of read them more as discussion points than criticisms. Uh, and, and I think that's, again, one of the great assets of this Guitar Geek community that assembles here on Tuesdays for the Acoustic Tuesday show is we can have these discussions. We all are on our unique our very own, our very personal, unique guitar journey, and that's fine, and that's something that we can celebrate. We just need to find the gear that fits with where we wanna go. And that's that. Let's move on to one more comment. This comes from KB6YAF. I'll reveal the name later. It's actually from Russell D. Uh, he says this, I have a friend that once worked as a working guitarist in Los Angeles. He left his old Guild acoustic guitar in the trunk of his car for around 45 minutes. He came out, realized what he did, opened the case only to see the bridge had separated. He took it to a reputable violin maker, uh, I'm sorry, he took it to a reputable violin maker recommended to him. His guitar was salvageable, but he didn't have that guitar back for about six months. So yes, everything you mentioned, Tony, is true. Another thing, don't just walk away and leave your guitar. They tend to grow little legs and walk away, never to be seen again. Uh, wise words from Russell D there, and yes, certainly don't leave your guitar in a car because the heat can really uh, wreak havoc on your instrument. And just in closing there, I want to thank everybody for all the comments. As I mentioned before, I'm so appreciative of each and every viewer of this show. You know, I, I, I have seen the Acoustic Tuesday show grow from just a few viewers to, you know, thousands and thousands upon even within the first hour. And it's it's so cool to know that, you know, guitar geeks are taking time out of their day 
to spend time with me here on the Acoustic Tuesday show and really with, with one another. So uh, bottom line, thank you so much. And I've just another quick reminder, uh, if you haven't thought of a question for Molly Tuttle yet, the episode's still going on. You can still leave a comment below if you're thinking, God, I would love to ask Molly Tuttle how she practices or what's her favorite guitar in her guitar arsenal. Uh, go ahead and leave that in the comments below. Uh, just a quick reminder there. And one, one other thing, uh, just a quick visit to the mailbag here. A couple episodes back, uh, George Van Wyn actually left a comment and he said, man, Tone, I really wish you would have said something about the CD that I sent you. And I said, man, George, I, I haven't, I haven't received it yet. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, I, I would have totally said thanks on the air if, if I did. Well, lo and behold, I checked the mailbox. I opened the little door and a big smile came across my face because there was an envelope from George Van Wyn who took the time to make a CD for me that contains a bunch of guitars that he thinks I would find interesting. And not to mention the CD, three pages of factoids about the guitarist. You wanna talk about guitar geeky? You wanna talk about something totally up my alley? This is it. Thank you very much, George. I'm so happy that it came because when you described it in your comment, I was like a little crushed because I wanted to check it out. So thanks so much for sending that in, George. And speaking of our viewing audience, uh, we had a guitarsonal submission and I am so delighted. I want to share it with you. This comes from George W. in Clarksville, Tennessee. And he says this, Recording King, which was my first guitar. These are the contents of his guitar arsenal. Recording King, his first guitar. A Fender Squire, to add a little elective to my knowledge. And my favorite finger style guitar, a Cordoba, which I am holding. I wanna thank George for uh, sending in a picture of his guitar arsenal. If you wanna send in a picture of your guitar arsenal, it's very easy. Number one, order yourself a guitar arsenal shirt. Just go to AcousticTuesday.store, pick out your favorite color, get it shipped to your door. Once you get it, go ahead and put it on, take a picture amongst all of your guitars, just like George did, and then submit it at AcousticLife.tv. There's a submit link in the top menu. You can click on that, upload your picture, and then of course, tell us what guitars are in your guitar arsenal. All right, moving on. One more thing from our viewing audience, and this is a guitar gratitude from Michael Bennett, and I think it's just perfect. So I wanna share this with you right now. Take it away, Michael B. Hi, I'm Michael B. I'm living alone in isolation because of this virus here in New Jersey and around the world. And I'm grateful to have my guitar because it makes no sound. And I got your forums, I got your Facebook pages, and I got encouraging guitar geeks all over the world that uh, make the experience even more enjoyable, and make me feel a lot less alone. So great to hear from Michael, and I really appreciate his sentiment of, you know, the guitar just provides company. And I couldn't help but notice, as a guitar geek, he was kind of, you know, hugging his guitar and I thought, man, that is so fitting and so guitar geeky. So thanks so much, Michael. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, you know what? I got some gratitude I wanna share. Get things that the guitar have brought into my life that I never saw coming, I wanna tell people about it. If that's you and you wanna share your guitar gratitude, please visit guitargratitude.com. Uh, you'll be prompted to submit a 60 seconds or less video. It's really easy at the one click of a button you could be recording and just telling us all what you're grateful for in terms of your guitar community, in terms of other things the guitar has brought into your life. Once you're done, it submits automatically, I see it and bam, you get featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show just like Michael B. All right, one thing I wanna do right now, before we close out the show, I've got your trivia answer, and of course we'll take a sneak peek into next week, but one of the things I wanna do right now is I wanna go back to two of Molly's lessons. One really kind of hits, hits this on the head, is that lesson about ego. And I wanted to very quickly chat about your guitar journey. And so often, this kind of comes from a weekend of me thinking about my personal guitar journey. And, and I thought to myself, gosh, if I have these thoughts, chances are other guitar geeks have these thoughts as well. And this is something I've talked about before, but it really hit me kind of square in the face after listening to Molly talk about ego being the enemy. And I want to talk about comparison mindset. Bottom line, a comparison mindset in your guitar journey will ruin the fun will halt your progress, and ultimately, you'll start to feel like guitar playing is a chore. 
I don't want you to feel like that at all. And apparently neither does Molly, according to what she says. So I wanna talk about comparison mindset for a second. You know, we've been talking about Guitar Heroes. A few episodes back, we featured Tommy Emanuel. Now we're featuring Molly Tuttle. And I think it's very healthy to draw inspiration from your guitar heroes. It's very healthy to look at your guitar heroes and say, wow, they've, they've put in some time, they are passionate, and it shows because they're amazing. But I, do, I think it is extremely unhealthy to compare your guitar journey to anyone else's. Quite simply, you're, you entered your guitar journey to have fulfillment, to have fun, to have excitement from the guitar for you. And the reason I say this is because this weekend I was, I was trying to learn this Tony Rice break uh, in the song Orphan Annie. And I'm, I'm listening to the song, playing it back, slowing it down, listening, playing it back, slowing it down. A long process. It was a, it was a good Sunday of guitar playing. Let's just put it that way. But I thought after I had learned it and was making some headway, I'm like, am I, am I ever going to actually just play this note for note? And... The answer is no, but prior to thinking that, I remember having this moment of like, man, I'm never gonna get this. I'm not, I'm not good. I'm, I'm not good. I'm not good enough to do this. And I thought to myself, man, that is a negative feel. That is a crummy feeling to just, to just sit there and say, I'm not good enough to do this. That sucks. And I, I think it came from me comparing myself to Tony Rice's playing, which is insane because although we share the same first name, we're vastly different. We have different experiences. Our guitar journeys have taken us to different places. And I think this is this is a little, little nugget that I want to pull out and share with you because I think this comparison mindset, as I've mentioned before, is unhealthy because we start thinking we should be doing things. We should be better. We should be working on something. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. And oftentimes those fall under the category of not being fun. I should be, I know this isn't fun. You know, that's what you say. I, I know this isn't fun, but I should be doing that because it's going to be making me a better player. And while that may be true, I would rather have you say, you know what? I can draw inspiration from all my guitar heroes, but I'm going to focus on me and my progress. And I'm going to really sink into that. And if you compare yourself to anybody, be it yourself from a week ago or a year ago or a month ago, compare yourself to how much you've grown. Compare yourself to that younger version of you and, and look at it that way and say, wow, you know, from, from that point, I've really grown a whole bunch. That's a much more positive light to view your guitar journey. Again, there's nothing wrong with drawing inspiration from your guitar heroes, but in terms of comparing to them, don't do that. Focus on yourself. And you know what? If, if you're saying, cool, I'm going to do this and, and, and your objective is to make a clean, buzz-free G chord and you do that, love it. Find excitement in that. Find celebration in that because that's amazing. And if you start comparing that to other guitar players, stop yourself because you just did an amazing feat. If you're trying to play a song by ear and you do that, celebrate that. Quit, try your best to quit comparing yourself to other guitar players and focus on your guitar journey. And if you do interact with other guitar players, which I hope you do, make sure it's in a supportive way. Cheer them on. Help them celebrate the things that they're doing for themselves on their guitar journey. Not to get on my soapbox here, but I did get on my soapbox uh, because I experienced you know, the negativity of that and I don't, I don't want you to experience that or I want you to try and avoid it at all costs. So say yes to inspiration, say no to comparison. I'll leave it at that. All right, I've got to go ahead and wrap up the show here, but there's one thing I've got to do first, and that is give you your Guitar Geek Trivia answer. First, a quick reminder of what the question actually was, and yes, of course, it was about Molly Tuttle. How many IBMA Guitar Player of the Year awards has Molly Tuttle won as of June 2020? Was it zero, one, two, or three? Well, if you answered two, you are correct. In 2017, Molly was the first woman to win the International Bluegrass Music Association's Guitar Player of the Year Award. In 2018, she won the award again, along with being named the Americana Music Association's Instrumentalist of the Year. In addition to those accolades, she also won the IBMA Momentum Award in 2016, the International Folk Music Award for Song of the Year in 2018, and another IBMA award, the IBMA Recorded Event of the Year, also in 2018. Quite the, uh, 
quite the list of accolades there, and uh, I should just take a second on behalf of all of us guitar geeks at Acoustic Tuesday, congratulate Molly Tuttle for that. Uh, pretty amazing, you know, doing my research, I realized she was born in 1993, and uh, that's a pretty short time to amass such recognition, and it's well-deserved. I mean, she's worked her butt off, and uh, wow, she's just a great player, and 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 definitely an inspiration uh, to, to myself, but probably a lot of a lot of you guitar geeks as well. All right, in wrapping up the show, as tradition indicates, dictates, we need to take a quick sneak peek into next week. Now, next week, we're going to learn how guitar players change the world, and I'd venture to guess that you and I are changing the world every day that we play music, but specifically, we're going to look at five picking patterns that change the guitar forever that changed the way you look at the guitar, that changed the way I look at the guitar, that really revolutionized how all of us guitar geeks approach the guitar. That's happening next week, amongst a bunch of other fun stuff. We are nearing the three-year anniversary of Acoustic Tuesday. I can't even believe it. It's stunning to me that we've been doing this for three years and just growing stronger, guitar geek by guitar geek, every single episode. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for being a guitar geek and just sharing your passion for the guitar with me and all of us guitar geeks that watch the show. And uh, remember, you can catch the Acoustic Tuesday show every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. And of course, for your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, please visit AcousticLife.tv where you can do a deep dive on anything I've ever featured in the show before. Again, thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Remember, Guitar Geeks Unite, and I'll see you next Tuesday.